Hi, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Hoosier Outdoors with John Martino and Friends. Today we're at the 6th Annual Wild Indiana Outdoor Show, which takes place in Kokomo at the Kokomo Conference and Event Center. This year is very special. We have Bash University, 70 vendors, hunter education class, and many guest speakers. Today's headliner was legendary Hank Parker, and he gave a great presentation. So if you've never been to Wild Indiana Outdoors, Please visit us at the Kokomo Conference and Event Center. Thank you. Everybody ready. This is the moment that you have been waiting for. This gentleman right here is a legend in the sport of fishing. He has brought happiness to so many of us, so much joy in our lives. Can I can I go ahead and do this? Yes. Do 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 Where's he at? He's right here in Kokomo, Indiana. Give it up. It's the legend, Hank Parker. Yes! Louder for Hank. It's Hank. This is Hank Parker. Man, it's good to be here. Is everybody having fun? That's good. Hey, I want to announce I've been over at the Ranger Boat booth. Uh, they've got a big sale today. You can buy two Rangers today for the price of two. So uh, go out, they'll mix and match, you get any color you want, and it's all right there. They got some great looking boats, uh, two for two. So be sure and go over and take advantage of this incredible sale. I have, uh, I have had a big time. I've been at the archery trade show, and so when I go to the archery trade show, everybody says, "Well, I thought you was a bass fisherman." And half the time when I go to, uh, I go to the fishing show because we've had a hunting show now for 15 years. And uh, people say, well, I thought you was a deer hunter. So I'm both a deer hunter and a bass fisherman. I do anything uh, to keep a, from having a real job. <laughs> they all the time think if I could give them one tip that would make them a better fisherman or a better hunter, and it's without a doubt get rid of that job. A job will mess you up. Boy, I tell you, I had one I never got rid of. It. So uh, I, I like to hunt and I like to fish. So people say, well, would you rather hunt? Or would you rather fish? And I said, well, if it's November, I would rather hunt. If it's June, I would rather fish. So that's that's the way I keep it. I hunt and I fish. And we have a big time. And today, I'm going to do a little seminar on hunting and a little seminar on fishing. Uh, but I've been fishing longer than I've been hunting. So I'm going to start out talking a little bit about fishing. And I like to have fun. Fun is a big part of being a good granddad, being a good dad, or being a good mentor to a kid that you take fishing. We got to keep it fun. If we get too serious and put too much pressure on hunting or fishing, you take the fun out of it. So the main thing is keep it fun. And I like having fun. And I love to fish. I love to fish. I love the deer hunt. I get just so excited. Uh, uh, and, and I'm I'm 40, 26 years old, <laughs> and I get so excited every time I get to go fishing or get to go hunting. So uh, the fun part is really, really important. So you, you got you got to keep it fun. I uh, I started out uh, years ago with the dream of being a professional bass fisherman. And how crazy is that? How awesome is it to live in a country? that we can pursue happiness and have a dream of being a professional bass fisherman and be able to go out and do it. So I, I've had an incredible career and it's been really, really, really fun. And several years ago, uh, we were fishing a BASS tournament and uh, no one, uh, uh, bass had never canceled the day of competition. But they were having a bad storm. We were in the Potomac River in Washington, D.C. and the United States Coast Guard, they came and they asked Ray Scott uh, if he would cancel the second day of competition because they felt like it was gonna be high wind advisory and it would be dangerous. And so they canceled the first day of comp uh, second day of competition. So we're already there. And we're all these guys and we don't have a clue what to do with ourselves. So Ray said, hey, we're gonna cancel competition but in the morning, if you want to do it, come down and we'll all have breakfast together. So here we are, a hundred guys having breakfast, and Ricky Clun and Rowan Martin are standing in the corner like two little schoolboys, 
arguing on who's the greatest bass fisher. So Ray walks up and he says, let me tell you who's going to go down in history as the greatest bass fisherman. That's going to be the guy that wins the Grand Slam. So we're all looking at Ray like he's got two heads. What is the Grand Slam? I never heard that in my life. Ray said, ain't that be somebody that wins every event? That would be a Bass Angler of the Year. That would be Bass Master Classic. That would be a qualifying tournament. And that would be a super tournament. Nobody's ever done that before. So I thought, wow, I've won three of them. I'd like to be the dude that wins the Grand Flame. Would that not be cool? So that year, the, the super tournament, which I had never won, uh, was on Lake Lanier. And Gary Klein from Orville, California, Gary caught a giant bag uh, the first day of that tournament. And it was a four-day event. So we went on and fished all those days. And the last day of the tournament, I came in with the biggest bag of the tournament. So Ray Scott said, hold oh, the biggest string of the tournament, Hank Parker, Denver, North Carolina. Come up here, Hank. Let's hold these fish up. So I held them up, and Dewey Kendrick was the waymaster. So Dewey held up a couple, Ray held up a couple, I held up a couple, and we walk up and down the stage with these big baths, put them back in the bag, put them on the scales, and we weighed them. So I took the lead. So Gary Klein comes in, and Ray says, okay, Gary, Hanks took the lead. You need 15-10 to win, 15-9 to tie. Didn't hold them up, didn't take any pictures, brought them in, set the bag on the scale. He had 15-10. He beat me one ounce. There went my grand slam, there went my dream. Plus, first place was 150 grand, second place was 50. So that went $100,000 one ounce. So it was okay. As fate would have it, the next year, the Super Bass tournament was on the St. John's River, and I won by 20 pounds. So I became the first angler in history to win the Grand Slam. But that ain't the story. The Grand Slam was a big deal to me, but it ain't that big a deal nationwide. The Classic is the big deal. So here we go just a few years down the road, Deja Vu. Jim Bitter, Orlando, Florida, catches a big bag first day of the 1989 Bassmaster Classic. I fish all week, come in the last day, biggest bag of the tournament. Ray Scott, Hank Parker, Denver, North Carolina, the biggest train of the tournament. Hold them up, Hank. Nope, Ray, I ain't holding them up. Put them on the schedule. <laughs> he said, no, 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 no. It's going to be a lot more dramatic if you'll hold those fish up. I said, Ray, it's plenty of drama for me, just like it is. Put them on the schedule. He didn't want to do it, but he finally put them on the schedule. I won by two ounces. If I'd have held them fish up, let all them water drops come off them fish. <laughs> I wouldn't have won the classic. So lessons you learn the hard way, you don't forget. Isn't that pretty awesome? I, uh, I learned the hard way. And I tell you, in that tournament, Jim Bitter had a fish that he would have won the tournament with, but when he put it on his measuring stick, it slipped out of his hands and fell back in the James River. People say, man, that was awesome. You caught that big string of fish the last day. But the smartest thing I did, that morning about 4.30, I got up in the boat yard. I put graphite oil on Jim Bitter's measuring stick. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out. you got to be all the spare and love and more enjoyment fishing. But I, I've had so much fun. I, uh, I grew up in a little town in Maiden, North Carolina. Bill Earnhardt grew up right across the hill in Kannapolis, North Carolina, and he and I became really, really good friends, and uh, we had a deer lease together. And uh, so I'd always try to get him to do TV. Earnhardt hated to lose. He hated to lose. And all, all these professional athletes, they hate to lose. So when they get on your fishing show, they want to win. But I'm going to tell you, I learned a long time ago, fishing TV is a whole lot better than fishing tournaments. Because when you fish tournaments, they post your weight up there, and there's nothing you can do about it. But when you have your own TV show, it don't matter who you fish with or how many they catch, I edit. <laughs> <laughs> I win every week. So Arnhart knew he couldn't win, but uh, one day he, his little girl's name was Taylor, and my little girl named Lucy. I have five children, all, all girls, but four. And uh, Lucy and Taylor and Dale and I, we decided to do a show together. So if you know anything at all about today's NASCAR driver versus Dale Earnhardt, Dale Earnhardt was the intimidator. 
Dale Earnhardt was a different guy. And if you were like Jimmy Johnson, for example, if Jimmy was in a race and he blew an engine and he came into the pits and they stuck that microphone in his face uh, and started asking him questions, very quickly he would gain his composure and he would, he would be real articulate on what was happening. And they would ask him, like, Jimmy, what happened? You blew an engine, you're out of the race. What, what, what happened? And he would say something like, well, the number low's 48 Chevrolet was running great. Chad and the guys had a car prepared. We were just buying their time working away the front. We had a freak thing happen. We had a valve spring break. And with that valve spring broken, we just kept pushing. We finally broke the crank, and it took us out of the race. You asked Dale Earnhardt the exact same question, and he'd look at you with them little beady eyes and say, it blowed up. <laughs> End of story. So Taylor and Dale and Lucy uh, and I are out fishing. Taylor's got a little Mickey Mouse rod with him. And Taylor had a hand of catfish that is a little bit more than Mickey could bear. And Mickey's little ears are laying on the pond dam, and, and, and her little rod and reel has just tore all the pieces and uh, broke her line, and she's got her lip pooched out. And Earnhardt looks over there and says, Taylor, what happened? She looked at him with them little beady eyes and said, blow it up. <laughs> well, the apple don't fall far from the tree, you know. I have uh, my youngest son, Timmy, uh, from the time he was three years old, he loved to, uh, to wear this pocket watch my dad left me. My dad was killed in an automobile accident, and he left me this railroad pocket watch. Well, Timmy couldn't tell time, but this thing had a big old gold lid on it and a chain, and you could hook it on your belt. So every time we'd go fishing, we'd get that thing down out of the closet, and he would wear it. So one day he asked me, he said, Dad, can I have that watch? I said, no, little buddy, I'm going to tell you. That watch has got a lot of sentimental value out of my day. But I'll make a deal with you. When I die, you'll get the watch. He said, not the brothers? I said, no, not the brothers. You'll get the watch. He said, not Lucy? I said, no, not Lucy. You'll get the watch. He said, okay, shake on it, man. Check it. We shook on it, made a deal, went fishing. I came back, put that watch back up in the closet. I kept it in a little box. And I forgot all about the watch. It was probably six months later. One Sunday afternoon, I was in the bed with the flu. Sick of a dog. Boy, he came in there and put his little hand up on my head. And he said, did How you feeling? I said, I feel rough with him, buddy. He said, you tell mom about the watch. <laughs> it make a preparation. But, you know, it's all fun. It's all fun. Now, tournament fishing is business. Uh, and and it, it's a great way to make a living. Uh, I still love to fish for fun. I retired when, when, in 1989 when I won the Classic. I quit. I was 36 years old, and I'd had the best uh, year of my life. And, but I wanted to go home and spend time uh, and raise my kids, but I don't regret one minute of it. They got involved in NASCAR, my two oldest boys, Billy and Hank, and I'm like the guy in the AA meeting now. I can stand up here and, and raise my hand. I've been NASCAR free for 10 years. Uh, you want to make a small fortune uh, racing, you start with a large one. It will not take you long at all, so you, you can't burn money as fast. So I'm glad to be out of that. But I, I had a lot of fun with my kids. And kids is a lifelong partnership. I hear guys say, well, I put my kids through school. I did my part. I'm done. I'm never done with mine. Uh, but I'm going to be there for them, and they're there for me, and it's so awesome. And I now have 15 grandkids. And that is so that is so cool. My son Billy just adopted a little girl. Hank Jr. just adopted a little girl. And uh, so we have, uh, we have 15 total now, and I love every second of it. Uh, one of my little girls, Anna, uh, she told me the other day, she said, Papa, you think you're funny, but you're not. You're silly, and you're a grown man. <laughs> so them little girls, they keep you straight, you know. But I grew up, and I started fishing, and I started fishing competitively. And I hate to lose. And my greatest motivation was poverty. There is nothing like hunger that will make you perform. So I borrowed money on a 90-day note from the Northwestern Bank in North Carolina to go on the tournament circuit. So I had to finish in the money. Right now, I still hold the record. Uh, I finished in the, the money 73% of every tournament I ever fished in my whole career. But the greatest motivator was I had to get in the money to pay that bank note. So poverty will motivate. Uh, but I started out with that dream, and I, I started fishing. 
and I started putting a lot of things together. And, and I'm going to tell you, uh, there is so much in fishing. In my lifetime, when I started fishing, the method for catching fish was to entice a fish into bite the lure. You made that bait so lifelike, you enticed that fish into bite the lure. Well, then here comes this cat from California named D. Thomas. And right behind him was a guy named Dave Cleveland. And they had these great big rocks. And they used a technique I never heard of. They called it flipping. And so when Glebe and, and Dee came on the scene, they started just kicking high in. Man, they started winning all the tournament. How is that possible? What are they doing? They're pitching a little jig or a worm or a, a creature bait into a bush or into a hole, and they're getting these fish to fight when we can't get them to bite. So I learned there's two methods for catching fish. One, you can get a fish to react to a bait out of impulse, which you can catch him under a cold front condition that you can't entice a fish in the bottom. The first time I ever met Dave Libby, first of all, I knew he was from California the day I met him. I met him on the boat ramp at Lake Okeechobee at 4.30 in the morning and he had on sunglasses. I knew right then, okay, this cat. But I felt sorry for him. He had all these big old surf rods in his boat. And I thought, bless his heart, he ain't gonna catch nothing. And then, I would go and he'd be up, we were fishing these pepper grass beds and we were fishing all around them. And he was parked up on top of them, right on top of the fish. I thought, boy, he don't know nothing. Well, when that tournament was over, he won it with 95 pounds and 12 ounces. I finished fourth with 40 pounds. So he blew us away and he caught them flipping. So after that tournament was over, I talked to him. I said, Glee, how in the world did you catch those fish? He called it Tule Dipping. He said, oh, I'll just Tule Dipping a jig. Tule did they said, yeah, I would get up on top of that pepper grass and that cold front rolled in and all those fish were up under that pepper grass and he said, I'd just punch a little hole in my rod and drop my jig down and just keep repeating in that same little spot until finally I got one of those fish to hit. We just dropping it on their nose. So I learned a whole new method of fishing that I'd never been taught as a kid that I'd never learned growing up at all is you can catch a fish out of impulse. So I learned to fish a spinnerbait where I would fish a big, heavy, three-quarter ounce spinnerbait with smaller blades and I could run it up there and drop it right where I felt like that fish was positioned and I'd get them to react to it out of impulse. So we started winning tournaments under cold front conditions and if you fish enough tournament, you'll realize that every day is not a good, low pressure, perfect day at 60 degrees. You'll have all sorts of weather and all sorts of conditions. So if you, the more you know, the more you learn, the more versatile you are, the better you're going to be as a fisherman. I have so many people ask me, what's your favorite lure? To ask me what my favorite lure is, is like going up to an automobile mechanic and say, what's your favorite tool? Well, how can you have a favorite tool when every tool in that box has got a different purpose? Well, a fishing lure and a tackle box is nothing but a toolbox. It's a, it's a bunch of tools to do a job based on the situation. So it varies. So you can't have a favorite bait. If you have a favorite bait, I can tell you right now, I can make everybody in this room a better fisherman. Without a doubt. If you do have a favorite bait, leave it at home for one year, and you'll be a better fisherman at the end of that year. Because you depend on that bait when you should not depend on it. When you're not catching any fish, if you like a rattle trap and you're not catching any fish, you'll tie that rattle trap on because you have confidence in that bait. The biggest myth that Bassmaster ever printed is you must have confidence in your bait to be successful. I'm going to tell you, you must have confidence in your toolbox if you're going to be able to fix a car. You better have confidence in your tackle box if you're going to be consistent at catching fish. Because every day is different. And if you're a great, great worm fisherman and you've got a top water bite, you're in trouble. If you're a great top water fisherman and the fish are 30 feet deep on a jigging spoon, you're in trouble. So you need to be able to adapt and use whatever tool or lure to do the job. And if you don't do that, then you're not going to be consistent because conditions change. My son Ben 
Uh, he wanted to be a professional fisherman so bad. He borrowed, I don't know how much money he spent, I don't want to know. Uh, but he fished on the FLW circuit for three years. He's a heck of a fisherman. And if he goes fishing with me, he will beat me 90% of the time. But he won't find me. And he won't figure them out. If he does, he stays with the same thing. He don't change. People say, you know, conditions change. The fish change from day to day. Let me tell you something. Conditions change and fish change from hour to hour. So that toolbox is really important. Uh, when you need a 5 16 or a 3 quarter inch wrench, you better have a boat. It's really important when you're fishing that you know how to fish that jigging spoon as well as that drop shot, as well as that top water bait, as well as that lipless crank bait. You better know how to fish it all and you better know when to use it. So you read water and you adapt to the conditions. And if you don't do that, you're not going to be consistent. So when you go fishing, you need to always ask yourself, what lure do I have in my tackle box? that would most thoroughly fish this particular situation. And you choose a lure to do a job just like a mechanic would, a, a tool to fit a bolt head. So fishing can be fun, it can be simple, but it can be complicated. Sometimes patterns are extremely complicated. The first big money tournament I ever fished in my life, the first big money tournament, man, I was so excited. Uh, nobody had ever paid a hundred thousand dollars and I don't know what year this was 77 78 79 but there was a company called Project Sports and they had a hundred thousand dollar first place bass tournament Table Rock Missouri I was living in North Carolina I'm going to Table Rock brother and I'm gonna win me a hundred grand so I go to Table Rock and there is no one up the river except one other boat I went way up the river, and I'm only seeing one other boat. And we're playing musical cove. I'd come in a cove, uh, and he'd be going out. I'd be going out of the cove, and he'd be coming in. So we just played musical chairs all during the tournament. I finished about 14th in that tournament. The other boat, he won the tournament. His name was Larry Nixon. And when that tournament was over, I said, Nixon, man, you and I fished all over each other, and I said, I couldn't catch nothing but little fish. I said, man, you caught big bags every day. How did you catch your fish? He said, well, Hank, what were you doing? I said, Larry, I was going to those little secondary coves uh, and those drainage ditches with the water being high in those button bushes, and I was flipping the outside bushes. What were you doing, Larry? He said, I was going to those same coves, fishing those same bushes. I said, what were you using? He said, I was using a jig. He said, what was you using? I said, I was using a jig. He said, what color jig was you using? I said, I was using black and blue. I said, what color was you using? He said, black and blue. And he started laughing. He said, uh, what weight jig were you using? I said, well, I'd start out in the morning when there wasn't any wind. I was, I was flipping a quarter ounce, maybe a three-eighth. And then as the wind got up during the day, I'd, I'd flip a half ounce. I said, what was you flipping? He said, a one ounce. Water's two foot deep. I said, a one out. He said, yeah, did you have any big fish during practice follow your bait when you were lifting it out of the water? I said, I had it happen all during the tournament. He said, well, I had it happen in practice. And I figured that when I was lifting that bait out real fast and those big fish would chase it, if they wanted it fast coming out, they wanted it fast going in. He said, I put that one ounce jig on and immediately started catching some four and five pounds. I had the same data that he had. I had exactly the same thing that happened, I just wasn't as smart as he was. He adapted to the situation based on what the fish were telling him, and I didn't. He won a hundred grand and I got fifteen hundred. You gotta think. Little bitty subtle things. Every seminar you ever do with a group of fishermen, they all want you to pull the lure out of your pocket and say, hey, if you put this on, the fish are gonna come out with their fins up. That's what everybody wants, but it don't happen. Little bitty things make all the difference. If you go to the Bassmaster Classic and you can stand on the boat dock where they inspect the boats, if you could do that, you would see as every boat rides by, they all got the same lure. They all got big long flipping sticks. Their equipment is so similar. 
And some people are going to go out there and zero, and some people are going to come in with big bags. It's how you put it together, it's how you think, and it's how you, it's like a puzzle. You get the corner started, then you fill it in. And that's the way fishing is. And that's the way it became to me. The biggest turning point in my life is when David Cleavey killed us at Okeechobee with all those fish flipping that jig, tulip dipping in those little holes in the pepper grass at Okeechobee. A light came on in my head and said, I'm missing everything. It is about not only finesse fishing, but it's about getting fish to react to baits out of impulse. So it's all a thinking game, and it's putting things together and learning what those tools will do in that toolbox. And every time a new lure comes out, I like to learn about it. Because the more versatile you are, I remember when the drop shot came out. Uh, I never fished a drop shot in my life, but I liked it. It made sense to me. It was a reverse Carolina rig. So I went fishing with my son Ben. We went to Lanier in Georgia. And Ben had this little nose hook. I said, I like the idea, but I ain't fishing with that little hook. He said, oh, no, Dad, Dad, you need to fish that little nose hook. You're going to put that big hook, you ain't going to get as many bites. I said, hey, I'm fishing for big fish. I don't want that little big crybaby hook. I I'm not going to use it. 45 fish to zero, I changed to the little hook. <laughs> that nose hook makes all the difference in the world. So it's really important that you learn all the new techniques and you know what that toolbox, that tackle box is all about if you're going to catch fish. And so it's about change, it's about being versatile, and it's about thinking. It is a thinking game every day. And people say, well, I'm not going to fish tournament. I'm just fishing for fun. Well, let me promise you, it's a lot more fun to catch them than it is not to catch them. So you might as well learn all the techniques to help you catch fish when you're fishing for fun or whether you're fishing in a tournament. And tournament fishermen are more knowledgeable than people that don't fish tournaments. Now, sometimes people get mad at me. Let me tell you, I'm not saying that tournament fishermen are better fishermen. Tournament fishermen are more knowledgeable because they're subjected to all the information that they do and what didn't work and what the winner did that did work. Like Nixon, for example. Had I not been in a tournament, I would have said, hey man, I've been pitching bushes up the river and it's full of small fish and I had a ball and caught a lot, but there wasn't any big fish up there. But I couldn't say that because Nixon was up there and he wore them out and he caught some four and five pounds. So that was information that I got as a tournament fisherman that I would have never had if I wasn't fishing in a tournament. When I first started fishing tournament, we'd go out there on a bluebird day and we'd say, boy, it just wasn't biting today. I'd be fishing with a partner and we fished hard and neither one of us caught anything and we'd say, hey, it's just a bad day, they weren't biting. So we rolled up to the scales and there's Roland Martin with 30 pounds. They were biting for Roland Martin. Well, what was he doing different? So you get that information, it gives you more knowledge. So it's always good to coattail on what tournament fishermen are doing because they got a lot of data that they process to learn all these different techniques to help us catch fish. So it's a learning game, it's a fun game. We try to show that on television. We try to talk about what, uh, what will make you a better fisherman, the, the latest techniques, the, the methods that we found over the years that have tried and true. Uh, for catching fish, and all of that is a part of having more fun, being more knowledgeable, and, and catching more fish. So uh, that is kind of the way I grew up. That's kind of the way it's done. Once I got into television, uh, I like having fun. So we try to have fun, and we try to entertain uh, and give information, and that's important. Well, then we get over in the hunting side. So people that hunt, let me tell you, hunters are way more difficult than fishing. And there's a reason for that. If there was a hunting tournament and you got that same information that I got from Larry Nixon on how he beat me, then I would be more susceptible to listen. But most hunters never ever get in a competition and you you always feel like you're the best. When, when I'd go fishing and me and my partner would be out there all day and we didn't catch any fish, we're the two best fishermen on the lake. There ain't no doubt about it. We're the two best. And we didn't catch them so they wasn't biting. You can believe that until you come to the weigh-in. And then all of a sudden you realize you wasn't the best. 
Roland was the best on that day. Hunters don't have that. Hunters go out and they feel like they're the best hunter out there and they didn't kill anything, they didn't see anything, therefore uh, it was just a bad day or it was just the luck of the draw or it was just that area for that moment that they, there was nothing they could have done about that. So it varies from, from state to state based on whether you can bait or whether you can't bait. We're in Indiana, it's a no bait state. That puts you at a disadvantage. And I'm going to tell you, and I'll say this, and I don't know if there's anybody here from the DNR, but if you will look, if you will look around, we're losing our kids. In the state of Indiana, and I haven't looked at uh, any data, but I promise you, hunting license among 30-year-olds down is on a short decline. And I will promise you, when kids get of age to buy hunting license, there are less kids when they become of age now in the state of Indiana buying hunting license than there were 10 years ago. So the sport is dying. States that allow baiting have more youth participation. So every state in America should allow hunters to bait deer. Why? Because kids are into instant gratification. And let me tell you this, it ain't the kids' fault. It's my fault. But they've all got these things. And you say they're addicted. I'm going to tell you, when I walk out of my house and I hit my back pocket and my phone ain't in there, I panic. So I can't just blame the kids. I'm hooked on this stupid thing. I'm absolutely dependent on this stupid thing right here. If you watch kids, man, they're on it constantly. It is gratifying. It's instant gratification. So the challenge is, how do we get kids to lay them down and, and go hunting? Dads and uncles and moms and everybody else has got to work at getting our kids out in the woods. It's real. It's tangible. It's not artificial. It's not instant gratification. But if you can't bait, and I'm going to tell you this, I'm very fortunate. I won some pretty good tournaments at a pretty good time, and I got some land to hunt on. But well, let's say you work 40 hours a week and you work for that paycheck and you don't have a, enough money to go buy a big deer lease or you don't have land. You've got eight acres you can hunt over here and belong to your cousin or your granddad. You've got a little track of land. If you're allowed to bait, you and your son or you and your grandson has got a really good chance of killing a deer on that eight acres. If you're not allowed to bait, then you probably don't have a very good chance. And that kid is not going to go like I did. I went 17 trips before I ever saw my first deer. Kids are not going to do that today. It's not their fault. It's our fault. We've made it too easy on them. We've got them hooked on these cell phones. We, we want our kids to have it better than we've had. And we've not done a good job, I'm going to be honest with you. We've not disciplined our children. We've not taught them worth ethic, work ethics. And I'm looking in the mirror. I'm talking to me. It's our generation. Uh, we, we wanted our kids to have it too easy. Uh, they need to work. They need to understand. But they need to be exposed to the outdoors. And they need a daddy. And they need guidance. And, and it, it's fellowship and it's fun and it's important. But deer hunting is something that's real difficult if you don't have any land and you can't bait. So I'm a big advocate for babies. I, I think it will help you, and you may not kill a deer. There's a lot of art to bait it, and to kill a big deer over bait, you've got to be pretty knowledgeable on how to use it, because it can be way worse for you uh, than good for you. But as far as drawing numbers of deer that kids can see and interact with, I work with the Outdoor Dream Foundation. We take kids with life-threatening illnesses on dream hunts, and we almost don't ever go any place that you can't bait anymore. Because if you take these poor little kids that are really sick and they're hurting and they can't sit there for two or three hours and they're in pain, uh, you've got to have something that will happen. If you can't bait, you can't predict what these deer are going to do. So it's really important. Some people feel like, well, I think baiting is wrong. Uh, I, I, I think it takes more talent to, to, to not bait. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm a fisherman. And there ain't no doubt in my mind I can throw a naked hook out there and jerk it enough time I'm going to get a fish. But I do a whole lot better when I hook a little plastic worm on it. 
So I like baiting. If I'm going to fish, I'm going to have a bait in the water. I'm not going to throw a naked hook. If I'm going deer hunting, I'd like to be able to bait. I want to see the deer. I want to be able to attract the deer. But I'm going to tell you the difference between a deer hunter and a, and a bass fisherman. A bass fisherman, if he can have 14 electronics on that boat and have side imaging and down imaging and GPS and map, he's going to have everything he has. A deer hunter's been doing it this way for 30 years, so he's not utilizing all the new opportunities. Let me give you a quick example. I'm going to shoot a television show. I'm going to go to the state of Kentucky. And I used Kentucky, and I could use Indiana uh, for an illustration. But in Kentucky, where I hunt, there's less agriculture and more big oak woods. And there is a billion acorns falling on the ground. What is going to make a deer come to my acorn tree when he's got a billion to choose from? Now you go out, you scout, you find a deer trail, you find a bed in there, you find some big tracks, you know there's a buck deer, you find some rubs, you find some scrapes, and you try to do the best you can, but you're still, when it comes to a feeding deer, he's got a million options. So if you go out there and hunt uh, and try to shoot a television show, and you climb up a tree and scout do the best you can, you're hunting one place. But if you'll go out to, boy, I like this place, but I like this place better. Well, okay, this place I like, I'm going to put up a trail camera. I'm going to put a trail camera here. All right, I'm going to go over here. I like this one. I'm going to put a trail camera. When I'm through, i got a 10 trail cameras. So I'm hunting 11 places at one time. I'm hunting where I'm sitting plus all 10 of my trail cameras. And when I get down at noon, I'm going to go check my trail camera. And inevitably, out of 15 years of doing television, we'll end up killing that deer off of one of the pictures of the trail camera that's going to tell us where that deer is at. Now, I, I get covert trail cameras for free. I like that. That is one benefit uh, of being a professional outdoor. I get bow and arrows for free. I get rod and reels for free. I get rubber worms for free. I get trail cameras. For free. So I'm liberal with trail cameras. But I put up two trail cameras. So I put out 20. I put up two on every spot. You say, why do you do that? Well, I put one up where I got a steel shot and I can really look at that rack. I put the other one up facing the other direction and I put it on video. And that way, when I get that deer on camera, I know where he came and where he went. I know which direction. I know which wind and how to set my tree stand up. So now, I have got something hunting for me that's going to give me information that's going to make me a 10 times, not one, 10 times increasing my odds, make me a 10 times better hunter. Fishermen would do that in a heartbeat. Deer hunters, that's too much trouble. I don't need to do that. I've been hunting for 50 years. Well, how many deer do you have on the wall? What's your goal? What you want to achieve? But if you want to be a better hunter, uh, the more information you collect, the more data you have, the more information, the higher the odds are that you're going to be successful. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I had the greatest year of my entire life. I've been hunting for 45 years. I killed three bucks this year that have a Boone and Crockett score of 618 inches. i never done anything like that in my life. And I'm going to be honest with you. It was luck. It was absolute luck. I have worked so hard, just like I'm telling you, putting out those trigger. I didn't do one of them. I didn't do none of that. I was hunting a deer and I saw that monster. I saw a 244-inch deer out of the blue. And I just set up, put out some premier deer. I was in Texas. It was legal. Put out some premier deer, drew some does in. He came out 300 yards away, saw the does, came down there, and I stuck him up in Swacker Broadview. I got killed a 244-inch deer by far the biggest deer I've ever killed, but it was luck. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. But you can't count on that. You can't count on that. 90% of the deer that I have on the wall, I worked pretty hard and made it happen by running all those trail cameras, baiting an area and figuring out how to kill that deer. So fishing and hunting are not a lot different. But the mentality of the hunter versus the fisherman is a lot different. The mentality of the hunter, I learned this from my dad and I've done it this way for 20 years so I ain't going to change. It doesn't matter that there's something new. You can wait on this fisherman over here, he's waiting to get back my tobacco and they need to read what's new where he can implement that to his arsenal to make him a better fisherman.
So it's two different mindsets. But I just challenge hunters to think like a fisherman. Think about all the opportunities that you have with all the new technology to be a better hunter. People say, well, I don't need a new bow every year. Hey, there's been so much change in, in compound bows in the last 10 years, it's ridiculous. Uh, I, I try to be the best I can be. The one thing that set me apart from a lot of the other fishermen, and I'm going to tell you right off the bat, I do not have anywhere near the ability of Kevin Van Dam. I fished with him 15 times. He amazes me. Uh, his physical speed is incredible, but he processes mentally just as fast as he fishes. He's smart. He is really, really smart. I'm like Forrest Gump. I'm just not a smart man. Uh, but he is so incredible. Larry Nixon is amazing. He is so amazing on how he reads water. These guys have so much ability, it's unbelievable. I'm not in their league, but I can compete with them if I work hard enough. And that was the difference. To me, 99 is not a good number if 100 is achievable. Don't leave nothing laying on the table. I'm a big Clemson football fan. Clemson is going to play LSU tomorrow night uh, for the national championship. Last year, before the Alabama game, uh, the Clemson coach, Dabo Sweeney, he got his players one by one, and he walked up to his players and he said, let me tell you something. You cannot control what's going to happen tonight. You cannot control the flow of this game. You cannot control the officials. You cannot control the opponent. You can't even control your teammate. The only thing you have control of is your effort. And I want you to look me in my face and I want you to guarantee me that you're going to give me 100% of everything you've got on every play. Are you all in? All in. And if you watch that football game, they played an Alabama team that was superior and they beat them like a drum. And every player gave everything. That was me. Everything I got, if you beat me in a bass tournament, you beat me at the very best I had to offer. I never quit. I never gave up. I can't tell you how many times I was in 40th place, and they're going to pay 40th place money. We'd be on Lake Ontario. To cross Lake Ontario, you literally risk your life sometimes. And I'd have guys that I roomed with, guys that I knew, and I said, I'm going to Black River tomorrow. You're an idiot. You're in 40th place. The best you can do is move up to 30th. Uh, and you're going to take a chance and run all that. I ain't going to do that. I'm staying close to the dock. Man, I, I ain't going to make a check. If I do, it's a little bit of I would rather die and finish 40th, giving it all I got, than to put it on cruise control and finish 41st. Man, I want to win. I want to give it everything I got. And that is the way I was competitive. I'm the same way when I hunt. And I don't feel good about myself if I leave something laying on the table. Man, give it all you got. And if it's not fun, don't do it. That's what's fun for me. When I look back at the end of the day and I say, man, I did my very absolute best. I'm drained. I work. The difference between hunters and fishermen, hunters think way more casual than competitive fishing. You've got to take advantage of all the tools and all the opportunities. And since this is not a bait state, I won't go into all the different applications that can make you a better hunter uh, by using bait. Uh, and, and I understand all the, the, the EHD and, and all the skier, but I'm, I'm going to tell you this. If you're a hunter, 35 years ago, 35 years ago, I saw a big bulletin that scared me to death. Chronic waste disease. Chronic waste disease. CWD is going to be the end of the deer herd in America. 35 years ago. Wisconsin. Wisconsin is absolutely infested with chronic waste disease. There are probably 60% of the deer in the state of Wisconsin that is is that carries chronic waste. 
So the best thing we can do is work together and eradicate the deer herd in the state of Wisconsin and try to kill out chronic waste disease. So there was debates that went on. What are we going to do about this horrible chronic waste disease? It's going to be the end of America deer hunting. I heard it. I read it. I saw it. I saw all the bulletins. It's epidemic. It is a disaster. 35 years ago, the state of Wisconsin harvested more deer than any other state except Texas. Today, Wisconsin harvests more deer than any other state except Texas, which is five times the size. There were more Boone and Crockett deer put in the book 35 years ago in Wisconsin than any other state. Today, there's more Boone and Crockett deer put in the book in Wisconsin than any other state. So tell me what in the heck is going on? I don't get it. The biologists hate to hear me speak, but hey, I'm just telling you the facts. That is absolutely the truth. I ain't worried about chronic waste disease. And if I have a state that if they allow me to bait, I have more youth participation, I'm going to bait. If I have a state that i got people that can't afford a big deer lease and can't afford to go to Kansas and they can't afford to go to Texas and they only have 10 acres, I'm going to fight for that guy and his kids and his grandsons to have the right to draw deer to their land. So I'm a big advocate of let's get our kids in the outdoors and let's get over all the hype and the misinformation and get on with what's important and that's getting our kids uh, in the in the woods, man. That that's important. I don't, I don't know how much time I have. Uh, my wife, I don't know if you've seen that 911 commercial that says, "Hey, I'm falling and I can't get up." My wife bought me a T-shirt that says, "I'm talking and I can't shut up." <laughs> so I don't want to wear y'all out. I don't want to go over. Okay. Oh, I, I'm, I'm over my time limit. I've gone too far. I'm talking and I can't shut up. So I'm going to go right over here to the Ranger boat booth. And if you've got any questions, I'll try to answer them. But before I do that, I want to tell you something. My kids know I'm a Christian. Christians don't lie. Uh, my kids know I'm a fisherman. And fishermen lie all the time. So they've allowed me to embellish up to 50% without it being a lie. So I'll do that. Thank you so much. Yeah, let's go over here for about a minute. No, good, good job. Good job, Hank. Thank you. I, I might run out of my project.